Hey, what's up, guys? Uh, my name is Aaron Barnett. I am the director of Generation Next alongside of my incredible wife, Hannah, across the screen. Uh, we have the privilege today to interview one of our good friends, uh, Matt Cruz. He is an incredible leader. He lives in the city of Chicago. He's doing all things uh, church ministry. He is a powerhouse preacher. He loves God, loves people, and he really believes in um, helping people become um, sons and daughters. Um, Matt, welcome to the live webinar. I'm excited to talk about evangelism and all things next gen man bro i'm so honored to be on with you guys this is a blessing i love what god's doing with you and hannah and uh i'm excited for what he's going to do through this uh live show today yeah man so, it's good so, to have you. we're so glad you're here matt and for those of you who are tuning in and watching we just want to remind you what this show and this time is all about so if you are brand new to the generation next show welcome we're so glad that you are here um, as Aaron said, um, my name is Hannah Gronowski Barnett, and uh, we just really believe that it matters for us to have conversations about the future of the church. Mm -hmm. And the future of the church is the next generation. And we see the next generation walking away from the church at large, but we do believe there's still hope. We believe the future of the church is bright. We believe the next generation actually could, if we were to steward them correctly, usher us in to a time of church that is vibrant and exciting and beautiful. And so what we're talking about every single Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern time here on the Generation Next live show, um, Aaron and I are bringing on guests who are helping us understand the hearts of the next generation and helping us build strategy so that we can really see the next generation come back to church and ultimately back to Jesus. Um, real quick, I want to talk about some things that we have coming up and then we're going to jump into the show. Um, we have some really cool things coming up. So um, all throughout the rest of May, we're going to be having some group conversations. So in the past on the show, we've been doing kind of individual interviews that have been incredible, but going forward for just the month of May, we're having some group conversations about things like how to communicate to the next generation and what does it look like to really empower the next generation in different ways. So those are going to be some awesome conversations you won't want to miss. If you are somebody who knows a youth pastor or somebody specifically who's doing a lot of communication, to the next generation, I highly recommend this one that we're doing um, with um, three incredible leaders, Faith Schiller and Keenan Clark, and um, oh, one other person, Aaron House is on it. Um, it's gonna be I forget. <laughs> oh, our friend Reggie Hill. Oh, and, yeah, Reggie. Uh, they're all gonna be talking about how to effectively communicate to the next generation. And so if you're interested in that, or if you have somebody in your church, on your team, in your community who is preaching to young people, that is a great episode to send to them. We would love to invite them to join us here as well. But today we are talking all things evangelism and the microphone. And I love this topic because it's so important to the next generation. And a lot of times when we hear the word evangelism, especially if you're a millennial, like we are, um, like Aaron and I are, sometimes for some of us, evangelism kind of became a bad word because we had seen it done so poorly, right? We had seen some of the stereotypes. We had seen some of it kind of feel like a bait and switch. And yet we know that there was powerful evangelistic movements that happened even before us in previous mm -hmm. generations. Yeah. Yeah. And we also see in Gen Z, that there is a large evangelistic movement that's emerging out of Gen Z. And so that's really what we're talking about today with Matt is why is evangelism so important to the next generation? So anyway, that is the vision that we have for the show. Aaron, I'll let you kick it off with our first question for Matt. Yeah, Matt, um, super excited to have you. Like Hannah said, we're talking all things evangelism um, and the microphone today. What's really fascinating to me, uh, Matt, is the younger generation, you guys are like movement makers. Uh, you guys shake things up. You guys really care about creating movements, building things together, going on mission together, going into the world, even preaching on street corners, which was kind of even taboo. Um, a lot of people do it today in Gen Z. And um, you guys are like really turning a beautiful corner when it comes down to evangelism. Um, I would love to start this conversation off with just hearing your heart for it. 
Um, I know you're a traveling speaker as well. So I would like love to hear what your thoughts are on evangelism and why you have such a big heart for it. Yeah, you know, I always tell people evangelism is simply this, your relationship with God on display in public. So would your your walk with him, like you're displaying that to other people. It's, it's a lifestyle, you know, of loving on people. And, and it's nothing more, you know, I think that, um, you know, a lot of Gen Z, a lot of the, you know, believers in the church today, they're about like revival, a move of the spirit. And I'm all about that. You know, I believe that revival is an outpouring of God's spirit where yeah. God's people wake up, you know, and we have like this fresh awareness of his presence, presence. We have a new hatred for sin, a new love for his word. I'm all about that. And I, but I believe that revival is an experience in the church, but evangelism is an expression of the church. And I think that what we experience inside the four walls, it's got to break out like a river and begin to flow into our communities. And a lot of people, you know, they have a hard time with evangelism because they think, you know, I'm just not good enough. I feel timid. I feel shy. You know, I feel inadequate, um, Mm -hmm. you know, to go out and talk to people. I'm afraid of what can go wrong. My thing is like, look, this is what I learned. I, first of all, I used to be the most timid. I used to be the most shy. You know, I used to be the most anxious growing up in the church. I'm 25. I grew up born and raised in ministry, you know, come from a family of preachers, siblings preaching in in the youth and at at different services at church. And I would always get asked to preach and I would like freak out, you know, just like full of anxiety. I can't talk in front of people. Uh, But 19 years old, God gripped my heart. And in a nutshell, um, he just ignited this holy fire in me. This, This courage was infused within me to uh, just for this desire for souls to preach the gospel Mm. with power, with authority, with the love of Jesus. And I just began doing it. I began going out. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to shift my focus. I'm not going to be afraid of what can go wrong. I'm going to get excited about what can go right. You know, I'm going to look for the opportunity. And I, and I realized that um, our love should make non-believers question their disbelief in God. Come on, the love good. that we have should make people question why they don't believe in the Lord, why wow. they are where they are. Jesus says, this command I, I, I've given you, love your neighbor as yourself. People would know you by your love. And so mm-hmm. man, I think that's what evangelism is. You know, it's uh, it's loving on people, meeting them where they are. Um, it, it's sharing about the grace of God. And then discipleship is helping them to walk in it. Mm-hmm. So uh, my heart is for souls. I, I, I believe that you know, the, the word is alive and active, sharper than any, to, any two-edged sword. Proverbs tells us that for the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. Those who go out and win souls are wise. And mm-hmm. so I think we need to ask God to infect us with a love for the lost uh, so that mm-hmm. we can begin bleeding for the lost and going out there and realizing that, hey, people, man, they need hope. They need Jesus. And, and we've got the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead living in us. Greater is he, the Bible says, who lives mm-hmm. in us than he who is in the world. And so we need to step out in faith, move beyond our boundaries, move without hesitation because somebody's waiting on what God has called us to do. Wow. That is so powerful. And Matt, I love that you have that passion and that heart. And I honestly think it's so important. Um, Aaron and I are very passionate about the APEST, um, you Mm -hmm. know, kind of fivefold ministry conversation. I identify as an evangelist. I believe that's what God has put on my life. And so everything mm-hmm. you're saying, I'm just so passionate yeah. about. Like I I so believe that oftentimes one of the, the one of the ways that we are confusing, I think, the next generation is we're telling them the stories of what happened in the Bible when Jesus mm-hmm. would send out the disciples to effectively evangelize, telling people about the hope and the truth and the love of Jesus, right? Yeah. And yet, then we invite them into a church and tell them to sit there and that if they sit there long enough, they'll be a better follower of Jesus. But we're mm-hmm. never sending them back out with intention and mission. Mm-hmm. And I really think, and again, maybe this is just my evangelistic nature, but I really think if we could help the next generation realize and con- like connect to yeah. this mission of evangelism, their hearts would, would be unleashed because there's a mission, there's a goal, there's something that they have to be a part of. And yeah. uh, I, I see that as an opportunity. And yet 
I also know there's some real challenges to that, right? And I see some mm -hmm. of the Gen Z, I think that's why Gen Z is so passionate about evangelism because it is this mission. It's this right, opportunity to be a part of something larger than themselves to have yeah. them to go after. Um, but where are some of the breakdowns? Like, why do you think um, some churches are struggling maybe to unleash the next generation to go back into the church? What are some of the maybe lies that we believe subconsciously even um, specifically church leaders about the next generation that prevents us from challenging them towards evangelism? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think this young generation is looking for the raw truth. Like they want the real thing. They mm -hmm. want to, you know, encounter the real Jesus. They don't want, they don't want fake, dry, you know, dead religion. Like they want the real thing. And so I think that leaders need to be real. They need to be transparent. Um, and I think that's also why a lot of uh, young people are doing like their own thing and, and there's nothing wrong with wanting to do your own thing, but I think that it's so important to have a covering. It's so important mm -hmm. to have spiritual mo mothers and fathers that would begin to pour into us because that's how we'll be blessed out. And that's how we'll be covered to do what God has called us to do effectively. And, uh, and that on my mind right there, cause I have a, I have a burden for, for young people who are like not submitted to the covering. And also there could be reasons, which we're talking about now, it's the leaders need to be pure and real and, and like really invest in the next generation and make their ceiling our floor. You know, like mm -hmm. we want the real thing. We want to be covered, but we need real leaders with pure hearts and pure motives. And, um, but a lot, we, first of all, I think that we cannot expect to lead if we've never been led ourselves. That's great. You know, we have to submit under a cover. I think a lot of people, um, a lot of young people have many preachers and, and, and people they listen to, but yet few shepherds they submit to. You know, so I think that when we get submitted, when we lay down our spiritual roots in, 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 a, in a church and we make that house, we're home, our home, we can really learn. And, and but it's got to be a, a place where, you know, the the pastor, the leader is really having a heart for the next generation. I think that, like, for example, my pastor of Lighthouse Church, uh, this is the 26th year I've been attending there. My parents are the senior assistant pastors and our pastor invests in the next generation. I mean, he is all about the next generation. He, he oh. puts them up on the platform, like to preach all the time. He even calls the young people, the all-stars. He brings them up for like four weeks straight. Young people, young people are preaching. You got the young people, then you got like the young adults. And in both of them, we have the Ignite young adults and then the all-star young people. Wow. They go up there so young, little short mini people, and they're preaching the gospel. They're just doing that thing with passion. And, and my pastor, he's just all about it because wow. you got to give them space to be who they are. You got to give them space to, to just go out there and get comfortable, comfortable with this thing. And so I think that this next mm -hmm. generation is looking for real leaders, man, that, that would get real, that would get get in the in, in the mud in the trenches with them do life with them uh you know and, and smell like the sheep you know that's a real shepherd mm -hmm. when they smell like the sheep and and so um i see that a lot I, I see that in the heart of the young generation man they're looking for the real raw truth and they're yeah. looking for transparency yeah that's so good man i feel recently i was in orlando at a, uh, our exponential conference there was a young gun his name was mike and I asked him, I was like, hey, man, like what what are, you know, what are some things that senior leaders could do when it comes down to reaching the next generation? He's, he looked at me in the face and said, man, Aaron, to be honest, I just want the next the senior leaders in my life to look at me and give me responsibility. Wow. Um, so my question is, is like, you know, you're a young leader that really believes in covering. We have a lot of senior cr leaders cr chronologically watching this Zoom call. Um, you know, you are really invested in your church. You're really invested in multiple churches. You speak all over the place um, in different atmospheres, even. When it comes down to responsibility within the next generation, how do we, how do we as next gen leaders come alongside of um, leaders above us to really actually create space like you're talking about? What are like more practical, tangible things that we could walk out or do when it comes down to linking arms and, and, and talking about what does a covering feel like? Um, what does a covering can look like within the church? Um, what are some practical things? Can you dive into that a little bit more with even your senior pastor? Yeah, my pastor teaches us, you know, that honor begets honor. You know, I think we have to have a heart of honor, clothe ourselves with humility, 
you know, and when, when you get into that mindset and that, and that heart posture, you won't compare yourself to other people. You won't be in competition with other people. That's another main thing our pastor really uh, nails in us. He's like, you know, I love that you guys, and he does it in a way where he tells us, like, I love that you're, you're doing this. And really, if, if we're not, he's doing it because he may see it. And when he says it, you know, we start like applying it. Um, I see it a lot in the, in the young people at church and he's like, I love that none of you are in competition with each other. And he always wow. says that he always repeats himself. And I've learned uh, that, you know, the only competition we should have is who can serve each other better. Wow. You know, I really believe that. And I think if we get in a place where we honor, where we walk in humility and where we find opportunities to how can I serve you? I think that is such a place, man, where we can just, um, have a healthy a bond and healthy communication yeah, and a healthy so covering and everybody that's a healthy way we can link arms and also just like uh demonstration you mm -hmm. know i think the the world out there is not looking i think leonard ravenhill said this he said the world out there is not looking for a new definition of christianity they're looking for a new demonstration of christianity mm -hmm. and so what strengthens your spirit weakens your flesh when you see things uh, like be demonstrated like the love of the father mm -hmm. when you see that's you know fair. um Wow. signs and wonders follow the preaching of the word uh that really draws and attracts unbelievers in and in, in such a way to where like they're they're like man i may not believe in in the god that you're serving or I, may, I may not believe in what you're doing but i'm attracted to the message I, something is pulling me why because it's a natural instinct for creation to be attracted to its creator and so I think that it's so important mm -hmm. to walk in honor, walk in humility, uh, you know, um, look on how to ways to serve with your whole heart and demonstrate the gospel and say, man, th this is what Jesus would do. You know, growing up in the church with those wristbands, WWJD, what would Jesus yeah. do? You know, and we need to adopt these purpose statements today. You know, what would Jesus want me to do? in this location what would he want me to do in this situation and i think if we if we shift our mindset to that man we can see some amazing things begin to happen yeah that's so, that's so great matt one thing that i think is really unique about you is you are a phenomenal preacher and communicator and you have the opportunity to use that gift in some different arenas and yet you also personally have this commitment towards private evangelism and I think one thing that we have heard from senior leaders is they are concerned that we as the next generation are so consumed with the platform that we're missing out on what it means just do ministry. So good. I think that's fair. But I also see so many young leaders who, although we feel called to use our voice to preach the gospel on more of a stage setting with a microphone, it doesn't mean we're doing it instead of the private kinds of ministries, right? So mm -hmm. my question would be, these senior leaders who are watching, maybe they're youth pastors, maybe they're pastors, maybe they are small group leaders for the next generation, maybe they're a parent who wants their church to be better at reaching the next generation as they're thinking, I'll just tune in and, and hear some of this. What would you say to senior leaders about how to um, unleash the young leaders in their mm -hmm. churches and their communities to not be um, afraid of them when they feel called to the platform, but also encourage that private ministry. Like how, how can they do both and, and not make them mutually exclusive? Definitely. That is such a great question. I think that um, we cannot lead people to a place where we're not. You know, if we're not close with Jesus, we can't lead anyone there. So I love what you're saying, like yep. the private ministry. I think we need to learn that um, if we get a heart first to our devotion to Jesus, like, and we minister to him more than we minister to people, like everything else is going to come naturally. Um, but if I think, cause I had that, that concern too, you know, I'm like, I'm seeing these young people, um, you know, up there and they're preaching and, and uh, a lot of them don't even know better. They're like, man, I'm just up here. I got the opportunity to preach, you know, <laughs> and it does push them out of the comfort zone, which I love it too. But I'm like, you know, there is a, a burden for young people to be discipled and to know what that looks like. Like I need mm -hmm. to have my, my, my private devote. I need to nurture that daily with Christ. I need to be with him. And because I can't say I know him until I'm with him, mm -hmm. you know, when I'm with him, 
I'll always have something to give. When I'm with him, I'll never lack any good thing. You know, when when I'm with him, like that from that place, because I believe preaching is an outflow of what we've already experienced. Mm -hmm. And when we preach from that place, man, it, it's so much more effective. So I think that um, first it's getting them to know the importance of your private devotion to the Lord. And from that place, have a love to minister um, publicly, uh, but also to understand that young people are very ambitious. You know, they're very passionate. They're very like they're, they have this zeal. And I think that if we meet them where they are and not think, hey, right. you know, don't just want the platform like you got to have, you know, this as well. I think if we love because so many people will, you know, there's people out there that kind of beat you up and then people get all hurt and then, you know, things happen. But. My, my pastor says it like this. We don't do beat you up church. We do turn on, turn on the lights church. Mm -hmm. So we're going to turn on the lights for you. We're not going to beat you up over the head, but we're going to let you know in love, you know, so that you can have conviction in your heart to want to change. And wow. uh, cause I believe in order to be changed, you need to be challenged sometimes, you know? Um, but I, I would say that's my heart is for people to first pour into the relationship with him um, because we're, when you're in prayer, I believe, man, you can radiate power. When you mm. host his presence in private, you can carry his power in public. Something mm. happens. You see that pattern in Jesus' life. Every time he went away in the cool of the day to commune with the Father, and then he would go out to minister, the power of God would fall every time. People would be convicted. People would be drawn in by the love of Jesus, and and uh, miracles would begin to happen. So, um, yeah, with that being said, I think it's so important to spend time with him, and, um, and from that place, everything will begin to flow. Yeah, that's great. Matt, uh, question. What is it like in your context, like leading alongside with your generation, um, like in evangelism? You have a platform. Some people that you hang out really maybe don't. Um, you know, sometimes we do elevate the platform over his presence. But talk to me a little bit about like leading alongside of peers, like um, what are some ways that we can like learn and grow from you when it comes down to the next generation and just leading with, and how do we come alongside, uh, the next generation instead of like thinking all top down approach, how do we think more like deep and why? That's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, first I would say to a young person, even watching this or leaders that, you know, if you don't have a platform, like that is totally fine. You know, if you if you've got Jesus, he is your pulpit. You know, if he's all you have, then all you have is all you need. And so I would say, uh, you know, don't compare to other people who may have more influence. Uh, I'm a big believer in, um, you know, being hidden. You know, I think that we got to know that God's timing is accurate. He's never late. He's never early, but he's always on time. You know, and I think that he knows when we're ready for something. So I think walking alongside people who may not have a platform or just walking alongside them in general um, in ministry, I think that we have to be, like I said before, very transparent because there's some people who miss the mark. They'll have a shortcoming. Then they're like, man, I can't do this anymore. I feel really dirty. I feel messed up. And I'm not saying live in sin. You know, grace is not a license to sin, but it is an empowerment to overcome it. So I think that we need to give ourselves room to make mistakes. If we, if we mess up and we misspeak, if we miss the mark, you know, get back up. The Bible says a righteous man falls seven times, but he gets back up. Mm -hmm. I believe it's a righteous thing to get back up. God doesn't measure how many times we fall. He measures how many times we get back up. So I think a lot of people, that's a big thing when they fall, they're like, Oh, I'm done. You know, whatever it may be like, I can't wow. do it. They feel, so I think it's no, get back up, you know, come yeah. on, get, shake that off, get back up and get going. Keep your eyes, keep your gaze on Jesus. He gives perfect peace to those who keeps their eyes fixed mm -hmm. on him. Hebrews 12, 2, let us throw off everything in the sin that so easily entangles and snares us. And let us run with perseverance. There's a race marked out for us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer perfecter of our faith. So I think it's, it's, it's throwing off the things that keep us bound, making a habit of choosing the things that move us forward over the things mm -hmm. that hold us back. Wow. And, and, and just continuing continuing to run this race with perseverance, this race called faith, man. I think that that's the key and just doing life together saying, Hey, you know, the, and being open about your own struggles, your own mistakes, you know, Hey, if God did this for me, he can surely do it for you. You know, uh, because then some people will think, Oh, you never mess up, you know, because they're, because you're not transparent. They'll look at there's leaders out there like that. You know, young people are like, they're afraid to open up because they feel like they've never opened up. So I think mm -hmm. it's just being honest. It's being mm -hmm. open. I think it's, 
Pastor Michael Todd says that being hot or something like that's hot, um, uh, honest, open, and transparent. Yeah. So I think that's what it stands for. And I'm like, man, that blessed me because I'm like, young people are looking for that. You know, they're yeah. looking for people with just pure uh, intentions and that they would just love them where they are, you know, mm-hmm. and, uh, and, and that's what we need. That's yeah, good. that's so great. Matt, you know, some of our senior leaders might be watching this right now and they're thinking, okay, this is great. And if I was pastoring a Matt Cruz, I could do all these things, right? Like, you know your Bible and I wish our young people knew the Bible like that. Or I wish our young people were as passionate as Matt, right? So let's talk for a minute to the pastor or the youth, youth pastor or the leader who is looking around the young adults around them and all they're seeing is apathy. All they're seeing is kind of a one foot out, one foot in type of following Jesus. And yeah. maybe they're just feeling so discouraged and they're like, okay, it must be easy for Matt's pastor, but what about me pastoring my young adults, right? Um, what would you say to those kinds of leaders about how to spark that heart for mission and evangelism in their young adults? Yeah, the key is this, making Jesus Lord of everything. Why do I say that? No. Because when I grew up in the church, I was just a churchgoer. I was not a disciple. You know, I just uh-huh. was like, I was in it. I love God. No one can convince me he's not real. You know, there, there's a love there. But yet I, when I left, I wasn't living out what I professed to believe. You know, I, mm. I often tell people this. I had enough of God in my life not to enjoy the world, but I also had enough of the world in my life not to enjoy God. You know, so I was going through the motions and I realized that God was not after my perfection, but rather my surrender. Because when I'm living a surrendered life, he's Lord of every area. And so there's a difference I've learned between being saved and Jesus being Lord of my life. And um, I would say it this way, when he is our savior, uh, we have him, but when he's Lord, he has us. So my question is, how much of you does the Holy Spirit possess and control? When he's really Lord of your life, then you are going to have a passion for the things of God. When you see him, you cannot stay the same. When you, are, when you encounter him, you cannot deny him. And I think that from that place of making Jesus Lord and you move from being just a church member to a minister, a, you know, a churchgoer to a, a follower, a disciple of Jesus, man, you'll begin to have a passion uh, for, for ministry, for people. And uh, he just stirs your heart toward him, stirs your heart toward truth, stirs within you this desire for intimacy with him, a desire to reach the lost. Um, and so that, that's what I have experienced firsthand. Um, I, I, when I encountered the Lord at 19 and, uh, man, he just got a hold of me and my heart was burning for the things of God. I think it was when I really made Jesus Lord, I allowed him to sit in the driver's seat of my life. I made him the lover of my soul just sat on the throne of my heart. From then, that point, I began having a passion for people and missions and, and just going out there. And uh, and the key too is this, you know, it is not our call for people to um, accept the truth, but it is our call to ensure they have a chance to accept the truth. Mm-hmm. And so if we don't step out in faith, how are they going to, you know, have a chance to accept the gospel? So I think from that place of you're like, man, Jesus, have your way in every area of my life. Mm-hmm. Um, sit in the driver's seat, about, guide me and guard me, lead me. And then everything that I do from that place, you begin to see things happen. Yeah. Wow. That's so good. Um, Matt. So I think one thing that I've been thinking about recently is um, like two words, um, environment and experience. And when I look at your life, you are an inspirer. You like, I'm on this call. I'm like ready to like flip tables. Like, let's go into the world. <laughs> preach the gospel, man. Like you get me rowdy for like the things of Jesus and just really appreciate <laughs> uh, just, like your heart, man. Like you really inspire me. But one thing that I think about is like with um, environments and experience, like you really care about like experiencing God and then going into the environment and living out what you experience. Um, sometimes I also think the environment as leaders within the church is maybe not set up for the Holy spirit to move for Mm -hmm. evangelism to go forth in your context. What have you learned up to date about experience and environment and how do those like really go hand in hand 
to create room for the Holy Spirit, like to have his perfect work in you so that we can actually be more missional, not only through the church, in the local church, but also into the world. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, great question. I think that when you make space um, for people to come in and uh, you create space for them to come and encounter God, it's totally different. You know, I, I know, I'm sure you, you guys know about, you know, there's nothing wrong with, with having programs and, you know, structure. I believe in all that. I believe that's important. But a lot of the, a lot of the times I think that we need to minor in programs and major in prayer, you know, or have like a, uh, a services that really allow the Holy Spirit to come in and move or we surrender our agenda for his agenda. You know, yeah. we don't want to make the church in our image, but the image of Christ, you know, and I think that if we really allow God to come in and do what only he can do, what he alone is capable of doing, we can see a lot of young people's hearts be set ablaze. Um, so when they come in and they encounter the one who changes everything, like every year we have our annual Rise Up Revival conference and where people come in and, and they counter Jesus in such a way where they want to go out and turn the world upside down for Christ. You know, they want to just reach people for him and, um, you know, walk like him, emulate him with their life. Uh, but I think it's developing a love for Jesus so deeply in church services where the Holy Spirit is moving and stirring our hearts. Cause that's where we go in to be filled up so that we can pour out. That's mm -hmm. where we go into encounter the power of the Holy Spirit to become an, an encounter of the Holy Spirit. You know, wow. that's, we're not just in, cause church attendance isn't proof of our salvation. His residence in us is proof of our salvation. So I think that a lot of people, mm -hmm. you know, they, they want, direction when he wants affection you know they want they want the call without the burning bush so i think it's starting from that place of of encounter with him let him stir our hearts let him you know let him um pierce our hearts with compassion fill us you know with the, with the, with thoughts about him thoughts of peace and not of evil you know where our affections become heavenly our thoughts become heavenly and out of that place we'll begin to see him move, um, you know, in, in a unique way, but I think it's, it's creating spaces and allowing the Holy spirit to move in the way he desires. Uh, that's why I love when I go to church services and in, in, in places where like worship is so long, I'm like, Oh my gosh, I love this, you know, because there's going to be a lot more worship in heaven than preaching, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and worship is so powerful. You know, the devil used to be a worship leader in heaven. And he got kicked out. So when we lift up our hands and we worship, we're reminding him of what he once lost. And there's so much power in worship because you can't tell God who he is and him not tell you who you are. And when you know who you are, man, you're going to want to do the things of God. So there, there's so much to it. I, I think um, mm -hmm. in encountering the presence of God, he just does so much in your heart. And, um, and so that, that's where I'm at. And I'm like, let, let's, let's invite him to come in and have his way. And I know that uh, our minds are going to change. Our hearts are going to change. Our desires are going to become his desires. And then we can go do what he's called us to do effectively. Mm -hmm. yeah. So real quick, how do we, maybe, maybe there's like the lead pastor, you know, watching this call and he's like, man, this, this, this young gun is passionate. Like I totally get it. Like I want to create like more systems of flexibility within worship. Um, how do we introduce those topics like from a young leader's perspective, like from a place of honor when it comes down to how are we doing church? Like, how do we as young leaders like live in a place of honor, honoring those above us while also wanting um, maybe like a more flexible worship environment, maybe um, wanting a different uh, system in play when it comes down to the local church? Like, how do we lead with like honor, but then um, help senior leaders like educate around like where a church could shift or change? Yeah, great question. Um, man, doing it in an honorable way, you know, like um, really pray. I think first, man, prayer opens a door for God to really move, you know, especially if we're praying for somebody. Uh, we have to approach God confidently in the way that he loves that person more than we do. And uh, his desires at all would come to the knowledge of his will. Um, but I think that first we should pray that that God would stir our pastor's hearts, you know, or stir leaders hearts um, to really uh, do things the way God wants to do them in, in, in a way where it'll reach people. Yeah. Um, but the Bible also says you have not because you ask not. Right. <laughs> you know, so I think if we just approach them with, with such a humble heart and uh, you never know what God can do. So I think it's honestly it doesn't need to be, you know, too hard or 
a formula. I think that if we, we first are being praying, uh, if we're first praying about it, bringing it to God first, and if we feel led to, you know, go up to them, or you never know if we pray, God might speak to them, wow. you know, and then come wow. and then start changing things, you know, but, uh, uh, that, that's the way I would do it. Um, I would pray okay. and then, you know, I would go, I would approach, you know, my pastor, be like, you know, pastor in, in such an honorable way and yes. be like, man, I, I really think that, you know, so many young people desire this, you know, I think that if we, if this begins to happen, you know, if, man, God can move in a special and a unique way. Cause I believe that the kingdom of God is not going to be advanced by our churches becoming filled with people, but rather the people in our churches becoming filled with God. And how can they become filled with God by his presence manifesting, you know, and, and, and in a tangible way. And that happens mm -hmm. through worship that happens through, you know, allowing him to, to move the way he desires. Um, you know, and, and religion focuses on filling churches with people, but the gospel focuses on filling people with God. So I think it's man praying, asking man, and just believing that God would, would have his way. And, and fasting is a big key to, it moves the heart of God. Come on. That's so good, Matt. I think that's so powerful because that also gives a picture to leaders who might be on the other end of that. Like maybe they are the senior leader and they're going to have a young person come to them in the next couple of weeks. And in the past, maybe they would have thought, Oh, another young person that just wants to change our church. And because of this conversation, they're going to maybe wonder, maybe this young person has been praying. Like maybe mm -hmm. this person has been seeking the face of God uh -huh. and yeah. this is their act of obedience to come to me. And so if you're a senior leader listening, first of all, I just want to say thank you. I'm so humbled and grateful that you even would tune into a show where three young leaders are discovering and dreaming and asking questions about what the future of the church could look like. And on behalf of just the churches you're leading, um, we, we hope that you know that we're, we're so grateful that you would tune into this conversation. And, and next time a young person comes to you with a fresh idea for evangelism or worship or revival or the Holy Spirit, maybe ask them about where it came from. Ask them about the prayers that went into it. Ask about the Bible mm. that they've been reading that has informed this new vision. Mm. And believe that there is more than just a good idea behind what they're sharing, but maybe mm -hmm. they're the spirit that's coming through them mm -hmm. to you. Um, Matt, we're so grateful for your voice, for your leadership, mm -hmm. for your inspiration in this space. It's so, so powerful. I hope that all of our watchers are feeling as excited and inspired and ready to go as we are to unleash the next generation um, towards evangelism and towards walking out their unique purpose and passion in the world. Um, Matt, where can people go to find out more about the ministry that you're doing? Yeah, first, thank you so much for having me. What an honor. Like, this is so incredible. Um, I, I feel God all over this, and I'm excited to see how people are going to, uh, you know, move into the things of God after this and um, even sure. seek him for more. But you can, you can find me, uh, you can search my name on all platforms and I'll come up on YouTube. Uh, you just type in Matt Cruz or Instagram or Facebook. Uh, my website is mattcruzministries.com. Uh, you can find uh, so many different things on there to connect with the ministry and, uh, and watch different interviews and, and stuff like that. But um, I'm excited for what God's doing. I'm grateful to be a voice in any way. And um, I look forward to the days ahead. I believe that greater is coming. The best is yet to come. That's right. That's right. Amen and amen. Um, Aaron, would you close that in prayer? Yeah. Thanks so much, man. I really appreciate you, bro. Father, thank you uh, for this time. Yeah, God, I just uh, want to sit here in a posture of gratitude uh, for Matt and his life and his heart uh, for you and your word. Um, God, I just thank you that he is a leader that just resonates your presence um, and God, I just thank you that he's all about giving your presence to your people. And Father, I just pray that as we're sitting here and listening in and I'm leaving inspired and also convicted to go and read my Bible more, uh, <laughs> Father, I just thank you so much for uh, people that really care about your people. And so God, I pray that we'll carry that heartbeat out of this Zoom call, that we'll be people that are consumed with your presence because your presence really changes people. And so, Father, I pray that as we go about our ways, God, I pray that you'll just bless Matt and his ministries um, and his voice. God, I pray that you'll just turn extra favor upon him. Um, God, thank you for this moment and this time and space. I thank you for the new narrative that you're writing as a result. Father, we love you. Amen. Amen. Amen.